Hello and welcome to video 19. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the paper assignment for this one and I'm going to be talking about some writing exercises that I have given. Um, I'm uh, from the school that says that if you walk away from a humanities course with any any outcome at all, uh, better writing should be a part of it, right? Um, writing is a core skill here. So let me, uh, let me just preview what I'm doing in this video. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you, just run quickly over the instructions for the paper um, and why I've assigned the kind of paper that I've uh, assigned. And then I'm gonna give examples for the two writing exercises, well, actually the two parts of the writing exercise that I have assigned. One uh, looking at uh, good writing at the level of an individual sentence and the other at uh, paragraphs, uh, particularly opening paragraphs. And then I'm just going to uh, buzz through the paper topics just to be sure that you know what you're heading you're, you're heading in for you're, you're heading into. All right, paper topics. You're going to write uh, 1,000 to 1,500 words on a topic related. Uh, to the course, right? Um, you can select your uh, one of the paper topics in the handout, um, or you can develop your own paper topic. If you do decide to write on your own topic, just be sure to uh, run it by me first, just to be sure that you're not running off in the wrong direction. <clears throat> the Many of the topics that I give are extensions of the writing exercises that were originally in class writing exercises and are now online. Um, and you should feel free to develop ideas that you started in those exercises in your paper. So for instance, well, paper topic one was uh, on Socrates and Confucius as teachers. And you can draw on your answers to exercises eight and 19 for that. Um, a paper on topic two, which is about the cave, can draw on your answer to exercise 16, etc. Right? So, there are going to be two kinds of papers that you're going to be writing. Um, either you're writing a pure argument paper or you're writing an application and argument paper. In a pure argument paper, you take a stand on a philosophical issue and defend it. Um, you can take any stand you want, but and you will not be graded on the stand you take. You are graded on the quality of your defense. In other words, it's just about the argument. Uh, some of the other paper topics I've assigned are application and argument. And here what's going on is you take ideas and themes um, from Confucius and Plato and apply them to each other or to your own life, right? Um, and for these papers, the number and insightfulness of the comparisons and contrasts you can draw will be part of your grade. Um, however, part of your grade will also always be about, the last part of your paper will always be about some kind of evaluation. Um, and that's again when argument comes back. So you're, um, uh, again, there will be an argument and you will be graded on the quality of that argument, um, not on the stance you take. Uh, the paper that you write will not be a research paper. Um, I want you, uh, you can bring in outside sources if you're already familiar with them um, and maybe you wanna build off of something that you already thought about in another class. However, what I really want you to do is reflect for yourself on the philosophy that we have read here, right? So uh, there's no need to spend time Googling up additional information. Um, everything you need uh, is in your head, in your experience, and in the Plato and Confucius readings. Uh, plagiarism and citation conventions. Um, obviously, your paper has to be original. You cannot cut and paste. Your paper also has to be written for this course. I don't, it doesn't count technically as plagiarism to reuse a paper you wrote someplace else, but I don't allow it. 
You can expand on ideas that you've had in other places, but I want the writing to be, uh, I want 1,000 words worth of writing that is original in your, that is an original, authentic response to this, the material in this course. Um, because this isn't a research paper, you will probably only need to cite Confucius and Plato. Uh, for Confucius, you can just give me the book and analect number. I'm not going to be really worried about other citation conventions beyond that, like MLA or Chicago 15B or whatever. For Plato, you need to use the Stephanus numbers. Those are the ones that appear in the margins. Um, and I've been using them throughout so uh, you should at this point be used to referring to passages from Plato by those marginal numbers. For anything else, if it's not your idea, you need to tell me uh, where you got it and how to find it. Um, again, I'm not particular about citation format, but the purpose of a citation needs to be followed, which is to tell me where your ideas came from in a way that I can follow up on them. Okay, so that's the paper assignment. Now I've got two exercises around the paper project, um, uh, the first paper project. Uh, one is about editing sentences and one is about uh, opening paragraphs. So let's just talk about this. Uh, for the sentence exercises, my goal here is for you to practice simple, clear writing and to practice rewriting. Because 90% of writing is rewriting. Um, and um, when, I, when I ask you to rewrite, there's a certain style I'm going for. There are lots of different styles of writing, which are used for lots of different purposes. <clears throat> um, I want you to practice simple, direct, clear writing. And part of the reason for this is that um, I think philosophy is complicated enough as it is. And so you don't need to have your own words add more complication to it. The other is purely practical. This is the most uh, simple, clear writing is the style of writing that's going to be most useful in any workplace, right? Uh, a white collar job, you're going to have to do some write writing, even if it's just detailed emails. And uh, the kind of writing you want there is simple and clear. Okay, the other thing is that when you are rewriting, I want you to think about this, the function and structure of a sentence. And we'll talk about this as we go through um, this, as we go through my example. So what I'm, what I'm asking you to do for the, uh, uh, for the first part of the writing exercise is I've given you four sentences that are five sentences that are actual student sentences. Um, and I want you to rewrite them. I want you to rewrite them so that they are more simple and more clear. Um, and so I'm going to give you an example now of this kind of rewriting. I should say that there is no one right answer for how to rewrite a, a badly written sentence to the same way that there's no one right way to write a sentence. Um, so um, it may, you, lots of different things will come up and you may wind up taking totally different strategies from what, you know, for instance, I did when I rewrote those sentences. That's fine. Um, the idea is to practice the process so that you get used to the details of it. And part of that is going to be thinking about how the sentence is structured and why the different parts of the sentence are there. Okay, so here's my sample sentence. Um, currently, Alabama law, like all 50 states in the United States, allows the refusal of extraordinary and even ordinary care, which is a respect of, of autonomy that is similar to the way Oregon respects autonomy in the assisted suicide legislation. Thus, the Oregon law can be rightly implemented. All right, you probably need some context here. So um, this was back when I lived in Alabama, 20 years ago, and... Um, I was teaching bioethics, um, and a standard bioethics topic is uh, assisted suicide. And so this was a paper saying that Alabama should uh, implement a law similar to the one that they have in Oregon, um, 
which uh, allows for a, a physician-assisted suicide in certain highly select circumstances. But we're not talking about uh, the content of the paper, of the sentence here. We're talking about its structure. We're talking about the writing. Um, and this is what I call a Mojo Jojo sentence. Um, Mojo Jojo was the villain in a, a kid's cartoon uh, that my kids watched growing up, uh, Powerpuff Girls. And uh, he talked like this. And sometimes when I... Uh, I, I used to have clips of him that I would show in class because it's kind of funny, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, the point is that he, his, his, when he spoke, part of the joke was that he just went on and on and he repeated himself a lot. Um, so a Mojo Jojo sentence is just my term for a sentence that tries to jam too many ideas in one sentence. Sometimes these get called a run-on sentence, but other people use the term run-on sentence to only refer to what I would call a comma splice. So let's not worry about it. Let's just call this a run-on sentence. The point is that there's too much stuff here. Let's look at this first clause. Alabama law, like all 50 states in the United States. You don't need to say all 50 states in the United States. Once you say all 50 states, you've got the content. This little prepositional phrase here, in the United States, is unnecessary, so let's delete it. We can also delete um, <clears throat> law and currently and just have the subject of the sentence be Alabama. Alabama, like all 50 states, allows the refusal of extraordinary and even ordinary care. That is, uh, I should explain the, some of the bioethics background here. You are allowed to refuse medical treatment. That is just a, a basic part of informed consent. Um, there's a distinction that some bioethicists, particularly in the Catholic tradition, make between extraordinary care and ordinary care. Extraordinary care is something expensive and hard to come by. Um, ordinary care is just like um, CPR or um, antibiotics for an infection, that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes it's thought that you have different duties regarding what, what you're supposed to do for a patient. But in any case, the law says that you can refuse any care. That's, that, that is part of informed consent. All right, but let's take a look at this. So we, um, we delete currently law and in the United States, like that. And then we get Alabama, like all 50 states, allows the refusal of extraordinary and even ordinary care. Well, the second half of this sentence is still awkward, right? The refusal of, let's take that out of the passive voice, put it in the active voice. Alabama allows patients to refuse extraordinary and even ordinary care, like that. There we go. That helps a lot. Um, the next clause says, which is a respect of autonomy. A respect of, uh, that's not, uh, I used to have a good phrase to describe why that sounds weird. I can't remember it now, but that just sounds weird. What you really want to say here is out of respect for their autonomy, right? A respect is, of autonomy just sounds wrong, but I know what the student meant, they're saying you do this out of respect for patient autonomy, which is a fundamental value in bioethics. So we can say this, right? Alabama, like all 50 states, allows patients to refuse extra extraordinary and even ordinary care out of respect for their autonomy. That is similar to the way that Oregon respects autonomy in the assisted suicide legislation. See, this is still awkward. Let's delete that, and what we really want to do is start a new sentence here. That sentence was fine, just ending it right where it is. Um, and then you can say, Oregon's assisted suicide legislation is similarly motivated by respect for autonomy. Right? And then we'll just kill this last phrase and just say, and therefore can be rightly implemented. Right. So... This is what I've done from the sentence. I've cut 11 words. Um, and I, you may have found a way to cut actually more words out of it. Um, 
But uh, the main thing that I focused on here was actually keeping the structure simple. Because the structure is simple, um, it's, e it, it's more easily read. Um, and you also made it shorter. It's possible that the student originally wrote a 48 word sentence here in order to make a word minimum. Um, I would much rather read a paper that's too short than a paper that's full of unnecessary verbiage. Okay, so on the assignment, you're gonna get four, five sentences that you have to rewrite in this kind of style. Do it how you want, but make it shorter and clearer. All right, the other exercise I've got is about um, the purpose, uh, is about opening paragraphs and their purpose. Um, so in the style of paper you're writing here, which is basically an argument paper or maybe an application and argument paper, the purpose of the opening paragraph that is pretty narrow. Um, and these are just in order of importance. The most important thing is that you want to state a thesis, right? Um, but often you can't just state the thesis. You need to provide some context for that thesis, including technical definitions, background information. Uh, you want to preview the argument and you want to explain the importance of the topic. But you don't have to do these things. As these, this isn't as important for the style of writing I'm going for. Another thing that's not important for the style of writing that I am going for is having an opening hook. Uh, I'm certain people in your other writing classes taught you that your first sentence has to hook the reader. Um, and this is part of why so many student papers begin with phrases like, since the dawn of time, man has wondered about active and passive euthanasia. Um, uh, I generally find that the hooks that people come up with are mostly just cliches and I, I personally find them annoying. But also, um, the style of writing that I'm going for isn't about selling the paper. It's just about um, state, you know, uh, it's not newspaper writing. It's not trying to draw a reader in. Uh, you're sort of assuming that the reader wants to know about this already. So, you know, explain the importance of the topic, but you don't need to, like, um, set up a thrilling opening. Um, and if you do, do it well. Don't use a cliche. All right. So, one thing that I emphasize in teaching um, writing is that the beginnings and endings of things are important. That's where the reader pays attention, right? You start out paying attention, you space out a little in the middle, and then you read the end. So for a paragraph, the first sentence and the last sentence of a paragraph are going to stand out for the reader. The middle, they're not going to notice as much. So I refer to these as power positions. That is, they're just places that you want to put information that is uh, that you want to emphasize. The title and the subtitle are also power positions, right? Um, so I've got a mock-up of a paper here just with um, uh, a filler text, right? But uh, the point is to show visually where on the page people pay attention. They pay, pay attention to the title and the subtitle. They look at the first paragraph, and in that first paragraph, the first sentence and the last sentence. The first paragraph of the second, the first sentence of the second paragraph is also a power position. So now think about the things that you want to emphasize. Um, the reason why, you, the main thing I'm telling you to emphasize is your thesis, right? Um, so your thesis is, you're going to want to put it in one of those power positions. And the standard way of writing that they often teach in high school says that it's the last sentence of the first paragraph. You don't have to do it that way, but you want it, you don't want to hide it. 
you want it in one of the prominent places. So the exercise here has you um, review, uh, uh, has you read four, uh, three opening paragraphs and rate them and give comments to the student, the hypothetical student, about how they can improve their paragraph. Okay, let me just wrap up by um, running through the paper topics. Um, and so I should say in general with these, what I've done is I've got a main question or a topic in boldface. And then after that, I've got a list of other questions and things you, should, you can consider. You do not need to answer all those questions. You do not need to consider all those things. Um, that list is merely a set of uh, some prompts that could help you go in one direction or another, right? Um, so look at the first topic here. Compare and evaluate Confucius and Socrates as teachers. Um, and so the first thing I say is uh, list ways both obvious and subtle that they are similar and different citing text. Actually, you pretty much have to do that um, in order to do this. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, how, how you fill that out is up to you. So the next thing I say is consider, for instance, their claims to knowledge. Socrates claims he knows nothing. Is that different than what Confucius says when he says things that are... Uh, uh, wow, that's a typo. It says humanility. It's, that should just be humility. Um, in any case, the, uh, humility, I'm surprised it didn't flag that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you don't have to do this, but you know, that's a direction you might want to, uh, you might want to run with it. Right. Um, so this first example of a topic is, uh, it, it, it's a comparison topic, or you could call it an application topic. Uh, it's the sort of thing that I described earlier as application and evaluate. So you're going to want to, uh, you're going to be graded in part by the number and insightfulness of the comparisons and contrasts you can draw. But in the end, there's going to be an evaluation component, right? Um, you have to evaluate them, their effectiveness as teachers, and that is that is ultimately where the um, argument is going to come in. All right, and the next two topics are both um, autobiographical uh, education topics uh, or autobiographical application topics. Does the allegory of the cave fit your education? Does Confucius's spiritual autobiography in 2.4 fit your own development? This is an opportunity to do something that I think is very profoundly philosophical. Um, you know, know yourself. Um, and you don't have to confess anything that you're not comfortable with. You know, you can be as, as, as uh, casual as you want. Uh, certainly, since this is an autobiographical essay, you are totally allowed to use the first person. I'm not grading um, your life, obviously, but I, I'm grading, so if you can see at, uh, connections between the allegory and the cave in your life, um, and that it shows understanding of the allegory, that gives you credit, right? Um, and then, uh, again, there's gonna be the, the, uh, an evaluation component. What would, uh, how would Plato think? Do you think he's right? Um, and that's when you get into the real argument. Uh, filial piety is there is filial piety the root of goodness? This is a straight argumentation paper, um, and I think that this is this is interesting because I it's not uh, something that I think many Americans would initially say. So this is your chance to evaluate. Um, uh, a, 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 a fairly unusual ethical idea, probably from your perspective, right? Um, how would Confucius react to Socrates' decision in Apology and Crito? Confucius has very definite um, opinions about your duties to the state. 
um, and your duty is to corrupt rulers. Were the Athenians right to execute Socrates? Was Socrates right to stay in prison? For all of these, there are um, additional subtopics. Um, I often ask you to, so for was Socrates right to stay in prison? I say, uh, I ask you to break down Socrates' argument um, in terms of premises and conclusions, right? And uh, evaluate the truth of the premises and the strength of the inferences. Um, so all of these are different ways you can go with things. Um, and again, if you don't want to write on one of these topics, that's fine. Um, but I do ask that you run your topic by me just to be sure that you're not going completely off the rails.